although you know feelings run high and we might not like everything that Tim proposes, um, it's his job, and you know let's you know let's be uh, respectful. Um, second thing on there, um, so we're going to consider the minutes of the last meeting very briefly. Did anyone have any problems with them?
and there's an argument for not having uh, some of the further west parishes that are, uh, that are represented on the Camden to Cambridge scheme, but there ought to be representation from parishes like uh, Coton, Grantchester, and then further up, I don't know what the extent of the, of the route is, um, not just people around Junction 11. I think that's important. Okay. Yes, I, I agree that it would be a good idea to split them, but I am worried that we will, it will dilute our um, influence. Lucy? Um, I think it's a good idea to split them because I think that the, the Junction 11 work and some of the less to work has tended to get um, not sufficient focus because of the amount of time that's been spent on the A428 work. I also think that it's much easier to have smaller LLFs that you can bring together when it's relevant than it is to have big ones where you exclude people when it's not relevant, if that makes sense. So there is absolutely no reason why a smaller LLF looking at the Junction 11 work couldn't sometimes have joint meetings both with the um, Junction 13 area or with the um, A1307 group, depending on what the work was. And it's much easier to then have a joint meeting with two smaller groups than it is to say, we're, we're working on this and then we're not inviting you. Um, but I do think it is important that um, people who are organising the meetings realise that there will be many times when they need to have joint meetings because things will have an impact across a much wider area. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. One thing that would concern me is that there's been sort of a knock-on effect that the Western Orbital has become an issue in many respects because of the issue to do with the Camborne to Cambridge busway. So as people began to realise where people would end up they might start their journeys in Camborne and West Camborne, but they would eventually end up perhaps down in the Addenbrook site or somewhere. And so what you've had is this sort of building block effect where you start off saying, where are they coming from? Then you go in this sort of, what's going to happen at Junction 13? Then somebody says, well, actually, people don't just go to Cambridge. They go to the south of Cambridge and then add on the orbital as well. I see on the agenda tonight there's some talk about a park and ride at Junction 12, which is sort of, you know, being discussed and, and that sort of falls in between two stools and you've got this situation potentially by separating all these issues and if they're looked at in silos we could have this complete other mess where everybody looks at one specific issue in their area and they forget all the knock-on effects. While I take account of the fact that people are worried about the number of means they have to go to and how it's difficult to spread, I'm very very concerned that if, if these things are taken individually we could end up with a real pig's breakfast. In terms of the in terms of the solution. And in fact, to pick up on what you said there, you made reference to things appearing on the agenda. I don't think the agendas are being widely circulated. I am only receiving out my agendas, and that's what's making it very difficult to plan which meeting to go to. Well, that is coming actually, There's a, um, I, because I've raised a, um, a resolution on that this evening <coughs> about the lack of time. You know, it's, it's a ludicrously time uh, short time scale that we have to make any. Um, proper consideration of what are very important issues. Mm. But just going back to Des's point, I think that's true. I mean, we have a, a, a one or two, even two um, items on the agenda this evening raised by members, which actually make the point that um, um, the journey time sh should be to somewhere where people want to go. Yes. So, you know, there's no point putting the journey times from a park and ride to Grange Road, which is what we're going mm. to be consulted on in November and December. Mm -hmm. Actually, somebody wants to get to the park and ride and know how many minutes it's going to take to get to Adams, <coughs> the science park or you know, wherever. So they are inextricably linked, but I, but I think overall we're saying we're better off splitting them, but you know, with the possibility that we can link when there are issues that, um, that affect us all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I may, um, I, I think it was imagined that um, where the, um, the focus was on uh, the Junction 11 arrangements, that, that that would be the focus of, of what would be the new LF, I think, as you described. But if the Western Orbital route um, was to come back on the table after the um, Always England announcement in 2019 about the road investment strategy as to what that might be, um, that then perhaps the Western Orbital um, LLF as it is now would kind of reappear back in its um, current format. Okay. 
Okay, good. Um, I think I think the other thing um, that, uh, that is related to that is this evening. It, you know, given um, it is very highly likely that this this option will um, uh, will happen. Uh, we uh, my my um, recommendation would be that we avoid passing anything um, too controversial. We we air our views because I know there there is um, uh, disagreement <laughs> um, and. You know, we should be careful that in this form of LLF, we, we, you know, we're not um, we're not making statements that the next LLF would not necessarily agree with. It's just something to bear in mind, I think. Um, the final thing on this slide, I kind of want to glance at it. So, the resolution from the chair on unrealistic timescales. Uh, do I go? Okay, did everyone read this resolution? Do you want a couple of minutes? I'll give you the um, the background of it. Um, so I was particularly incensed in September by the time scale that we were given to read 52 reports that um, appeared on the GCP website on the 1st of September um, that we needed to try to feed into the Joint Assembly meeting on the 13th, so that's 12 days. So most of our members are parish councils um, and we need to read the documents and actually we don't make our decisions in isolation. We need to consult colleagues, form a view, decide if we want to raise a resolution, decide if we want to make a statement, make sure it's what the Parish Council think. Um, uh, and then, so what I did was I, uh, I decided to hold an LLF meeting as late as possible on the 11th of September. Um, so in the meantime, we needed to plan the agenda, we got all the contributions, draft resolutions, and we held the meeting. And then after the meeting, in the day and a half, um, I wrote the piece to present to the Joint Assembly and circulated the amended draft uh, resolution. We managed to get everything done um, and circulated on the 12th of September, only to turn up at the Joint Assembly meeting on the 13th and be reprimanded for not having circulated the information beforehand. And how we could do that, you know, most of us, this is not a day job. The, you know, the whole time scale just seems completely ridiculous. It's unrealistic. Um, and it feels, one could be, um, Forgiven for thinking um, that uh, it's avoiding taking account of local opinion because you know the joint assembly sit there. They had they, they've had 12 days to read the documents. They will have formed an opinion and have spoken to their colleagues. So by the time we turn up, actually we don't really uh, we're not really feeding into what they're doing at all. So what we're doing here is asking to extend timing by an additional week. So that you know, our views, although we realise, we recognise there are only advice we could better be to um, the decision making process. And that is a, a draft resolution. So has anybody else got any comments on that? Oh, I'm just saying it's correct. Yeah. 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 Can I ask a question? Oh, something else. Okay, two questions from the audience. I, I don't understand how the papers for the Joint Assembly this week were only published on the 27th, and there's an LLF meeting tonight at which it transpires that we're all supposed to have read the detailed papers for the Joint Assembly on the, on the 2nd, and we were supposed to have submitted all our questions by 10 a.m. this morning in connection with the paper. Now, as far as I'm concerned, somebody somewhere knows they made a conscious decision to cut out elements of the democratic process and make it impossible for us to be fully informed and ask questions. And I'm very unhappy about that. 
Well, we have to, I mean, they were actually published a week last Friday, so we've had nine days on this occasion. They were on the website, because I took them off and circulated them to everybody. But you don't get told... The link I, I got is dated the 27th. Yeah, but, we, you, but you don't get told that they're on there. You have to, you know, go and, and randomly find it. It just, it, 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 it's not... It's not being done properly. The process is, is very, very poor and, um, and uh, it's unsatisfactory given that we are the statutory consultative body um, and I think, the, uh, as, as the resolution says, the Joint Assembly ought to be concerned about what we think. I think from the, um, from the Residents Association point of view, uh, the arrangements leave a great deal to be desired. Uh, if we take the arrangements for this meeting, which perhaps are a little bit special, uh, I mean, it wasn't until pretty late on that uh, we found out there was going to be a meeting today, which actually conflicts uh, with the Southern Fringe Community Forum, which uh, a number of us were due to attend. Uh, so that that is a problem. And then actually finding out what the recommendation is likely to be uh, to the Joint Assembly is difficult. Uh, because you only find that out at the time that it's published in the papers for the Joint Assembly, which is in a document uh, that is very difficult to download, absolutely immense. It's not just the individual report. It's a whole gamut of stuff. Uh, and um, so, and having just the end of the stage, re end of stage report, is not sufficient because that doesn't tell you what the officers are actually recommending. So you need the report that's going to the Joint Assembly with a view to it going to the Executive Board. So all of that, and I have raised this directly with the officers, but the response is <coughs> that there isn't the administrative resource uh, to support circulation of papers. Well, frankly, if we're the uh, local liaison forum and we're supposed to be being consulted, our views taken into account, that's not good enough, let alone for members of the public. Mm. I, I, I think part of the problem has been caused by the fact that one of the early things we managed to achieve was that um, our recommendations fed directly into the Joint Assembly. Until that point, they were feeding into the project board, and then, you know, but we wanted, as the statutory consultative body, to be able to speak directly to the Joint Assembly. And I, and I, would, I still think it's important that we speak directly to the Joint Assembly. But of course then, there's been, you know, they, they get their papers 10 days in advance, and so we have to cram in a meeting in that interim. So that's why what we're asking here is for an extra week between the papers being published and the joint assembly, so that we can then reasonably have um, a week at the other end to feed into the joint assembly. <coughs> Can we, can we uh, vote on that, please, as it is a resolution? <coughs> so, all in favour? Say, um, can everyone hear me to start with? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm Tim Watkins, I'm the project manager for the Western Orbital. I'm here to present really just a summary of the paper that is online. Um, so I'm just going to run through that presentation now. OK. 
Okay, so really the 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 output of the report that I've um, proposed in the assembly um, is that um, Western Orbital itself is a, a linear scheme from junction 13 to junction 11 will effectively be on hold, um, subject to the Highways England Road Investment Strategy, known as RIS 2, um, which will um, in 2019 publish its um, findings, whether it's going to um, bring forward the smart motorway along um, from junction 9 to junction 13. Um, and so up until that point, that part of the project effectively will remain dormant until um, uh, Highways England make their announcement and their conclusion. Um, it's considered that um, in light of what, what they might or might not put forward, um, that uh, the Greater Cambridge Partnership um, shouldn't make its decision in advance of that. Um, actually, picking up on a point that Helen made earlier, um, an officer will, will be recommending that um, the bus priority at Junction 13, so that's the slips on, slips off, or how that might be managed as part of the A428 project, because of the, then the nature of um, this project largely moving to Junction 11 in, in its sort of geographical area, will be brought into the A428 uh, better busways Camden to Cambridge scheme. Um, <clears throat> It also um, states in the report that officers will not be recommending further assessment on the park and site of Junction 12, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in the presentation following, um, and that officers will be seeking a Junction 11 um, for the Executive Board to develop a full business um, case for a new park and ride site immediately north, northwest of um, Junction 11. So this is the plan, I apologise for the size of the plan, um, but really this is the study area of the sort of the slips that, um, that the Western Orbital was looking at for Junction 13, this is Junction 13, 12 um, and 11 here. So that was sort of the rough area of which the kind of the slips extend to and, and might interact with and therefore that's the sort of part of the study that we're suggesting should more better sit with the 428 scheme. Okay, so these are the button cycle sites. So previously we've talked about five possible sites. Um, we did in the process actually sit down to two sites. Um, they are site one and site five. However, when we looked at the access into those sites um, and the benefits that they would bring to the junction, junction 12, that, that is, um, it, it was considered that there was only very marginal benefit and in terms of um, the impact um, and the cost benefit analysis, of putting a parking cycle in um, either site one or five, um, it's considerably round that the, the marginal benefits wouldn't, reckon, uh, wouldn't uh, reconcile the, the outlay um, of the benefits that would be received. Could you show us where we are? <coughs> um, yeah, sure. Um, so this is Junction 12 here, um, coming off the slip road onto the, onto the roundabout here and then if you were sort of coming out of Cambridge, you come to the slip road here, and then you can go up and across the M11 here. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Could I just ask a quick question? So that's been taken off the table indefinitely. <coughs> I, I, I would say that's the recommendation. So um, uh, obviously the assembly and the board will, will have their say, but that's the officer's recommendation. Um, so this is Junction 13, um, and the, the two sites highlighted in red on the slide, <coughs> one being the existing site here, and this site being an area that the... Uh, junction 11. Junction, uh, sorry, yeah, Junction 11 here, Junction 11 here. This is the existing park and ride site, um, and this is a site on which Cambridge County Council has a land option um, associated with it. It was the subject of the public consultation or within the public consultation material. Um, and it's just to illustrate where they are on the proximity of the junction, junction 11. Um, and here um, shows um, a mapped um, forecast of where people will be, um, uh, uh, the catchment area for those people um, who will be parking and riding in 2031. The reason 2031 is chosen is because it's the um, local plan, uh, the end of the local plan study area, and so it's a, a, an area of growth 
that can be mapped in accordance with planning policy and partners policy of the city um, in South Camps. Um, so it shows the catchment area effectively um, of uh, the M11 and the E810. Can we have a look at the previous slide again? Yeah. So why has that one been chosen and not any of the others around there? Like the other quadrants? The other field. Or the other this why is that one? Um, as I was saying, um, that's the option um, uh, the Cambridge County Council has a land option for this um, this field. Doesn't Cambridge County Council also own land to the other side? Um, of the of the junction. I recall there was uh, here, here. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, but were you touch first if you yeah. came in? Yes. No. Oh. No. Because if forty four percent of traffic is coming down from the north, it would make more sense. Not to to cross the road, it? I mean a, a, a big problem we can see with this is how do you get traffic off that roundabout into that new Park and ride. <coughs> that is to go across over or under the A10, and that that is that is a, a major point. Uh, I think uh, they are some of the options um, uh, associated with accessing that site. Yes. Um, Sorry, on that uh, slide that we've just gone past. Yeah. Uh, why are the proportions different uh, to those in the presentation on the 20th of June? Because in that presentation, this is in terms of park and ride demand, uh, the proportion from the M11 South uh, was 32%, not 22%. Um, in which year is that? Is that um, well, I think you'll need to tell me, uh, because I think it was your, your presentation, that was the... Yeah, yeah. that's um, existing data based on historic surveys, so they're based on our side data from 2013. Whereas these figures come from uh, a forecast model of 2031. Right. So well, but this talks about park and ride demand, so it is a, it's an assessment of future need, as I understand it. <coughs> so, I, I, I mean, rather than extending it, I would appreciate a, an explanation subsequently. Yeah, uh, as, as I understand it, Chris, Chris's um, explanation. Chris works for um, uh, Atkins. And Atkins have done transport modelling, and as I understand, that's an establishment of the existing data, and that's a four parts. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm. What would also be interesting there would be not just where people are coming from, where yeah. vehicles are coming from, but where are the people then going to. Yeah, well, we have a, we have undertaken some uh, number plate recognition surveys. We haven't had data back from that survey yet. Um, however, that will give us a greater understanding of where they are going to. Which are already recommending this particular solution before you have that data gathered. That seems extraordinary to me. Well, I, I think that we can model where people are going to and the demand, um, and then the AMPR data would further um, enable that um, understanding. Mm -hmm. So there will be further modelling undertaken uh, as, as part of the development of the, of the business case, as I've quite understood. And I would submit that. Um, <coughs> The damage that you do with that proposed new site it far outweighs um, the 22% coming from the south. Because if you had your park and ride to the east of the M11, you wouldn't have to cross the motorway. You could have a, most people are coming from the north, 44%, um, 30% from the west. I'm not sure where the west is, whether those are from <coughs> along the A10. Yeah. Um, Still, it was 52%. Yeah, and the assumption that's been made currently is that actually the people coming southbound on the M11, the existing site is still open, so the easiest site for people coming southbound on the M11 is to access the existing site, whereas if we were to propose a new site, Actually, the people coming on the A10 and M11 North would access the new site. So, yeah. in fact, if you're looking at the percentages there, so 44%, um, actually, that, if you look at the expansion figures that we'll talk about at the moment, that sort of roughly works out at 
44% of the total park and ride usage at junction 11. Actually, that number correlates quite well to the existing site. People really behave that way, though, shouldn't we? The people who are getting in earliest in the morning are just going to go to the nearest park. Well, it depends if it's the easiest site to get to, doesn't it? If you're sort of coming along the A10, would you sort of no, you you track to go to the nearest in sight? Or would you go to the delay when you go on the bus and all this? I think you pick your, um, how, how long your journey would take in total. Yeah, I think that's better. Sure. So, either one would fill up first, and then the other one would fill up. Well, depending <coughs> on if you're queuing along the A10 to get to that in one, why would you not just get on, uh, get off at the first site, get a bus that's got bus priority into the Cambridge? So, as part of the work we've looked at is obviously access to and um, park and ride sites for travelling public, but also looking at a new site, how sort of a bus would link with priority between the new site and the existing site. So. I take them fully in this together, you have not factored in the concept of having a, a park and ride at Foxton where people could uh, get out of the cars and get onto the train. Um, we haven't factored in um, Foxton as a park and ride site. Um, there is no proposal for Foxton to be um, a park and ride site. We, we have repeatedly made resolutions that it should be considered, have we not? Why have you not done that? Um, well, um, my understanding is that a it, it wouldn't be a parking ride site, it would be a parking rail site, um, uh, but say additional parking facilities. My understanding is that the, um, that the Foxton um, uh, closure of the, of the level crossing is uh, it's a, it's a historical scheme that um, was originally commissioned by Network Rail, I think in 2012. Work was undertaken on that up until 2014, up, up until RIP 2, which is like the Network Rail um, methodology of, of doing a major transport study. Um, it's my understanding that there'll be a report going to the GCP Executive Board um, in March to pick up that scheme um, uh, with the inclusion of additional parking facilities at that site. Um, so th that, that would be my answer to the... To okay. the well, how, how do you factor that into the 30% that you're talking about coming up the... well, coming up or coming up? The, well, it's, it's impossible HM. to factor that in, having um, having only said that a um, there, there will be a recommendation that, that it may or may not be brought forward. Um, the board may or may not bring that forward, and, and we wouldn't know how much need or otherwise there is, um, or um, car parking would be allocated within that development. So um, they would all be unknowns. However, should they become more known, um, that that maybe that might be something that could be factored in. But my understanding was that, the, um, that many of the biomed um, uh, companies at, um, on the uh, biomedical site are actually most interested in the Cambridge site station as a, as a, as a, you know, a, you know, a hub and a means of getting there. And it just seems to be an obvious lack in the, you know, just to say it's not part of the scheme. And actually you could take out a proportion of the 22% by having a, um, um, a, a car park at park, uh, Foxton Station before all those people had to battle their way through Austin, of course, in the morning. And then the same on the M11 with, a, with you know, a, a, a southern uh, I'm not, I'm not sure people station. would drive to Foxton from the uh, M11. No, no, I'm not saying they would, but, yeah. but there would be then presumably a south route coming into the Cambridge South Station from the south, but then there would be somewhere there for them to park, so that before they had to do battle with the villages closest mm. to Cambridge to get to a park and ride. It just doesn't seem to be sensible to omit it from the consideration. Is that Foxton or um, Trumpeton Rail Station? Well, you know, they would park at Foxton, and mm. then they may park somewhere down, you know, on, on the on, on the southern railway that would presumably, a southern line would presumably come into Cambridge South Station, the King's Cross line, the Liverpool Street line. You could have a park and, and uh, you know, park and trains or park and rail somewhere down there. And people are not battling to get to a park and ride in order, in order to get on a box. I mean, I, I think the, the point to of, get to the to the biomedical. The point of the location here is the principle that it would intercept both traffic from the A10 and the M11. If the further out you would move that along the A11, it would mean that you would compromise demand um, from the M11. Um, and I think less people would be willing to travel um, that distance to Boston. Um, so, so I, I think that that's the, the point of this location here is that it intercepts both of those um, major transport routes. Why do you have to um, put everything on one site? Why can't you 
Um, so there were a number of people, probably the majority of people, wanted to go to the biomedical campus. We'll go by train, as Helen says. They will go from Foxton, Shepworth, Melbourne. All those stations will take them straight to Cambridge South. And then they can just... Well, the biomedical campus themselves have recommended that there be increased capacity at Park and Ride. And they're forecasting that the capacity at Trumpeton wouldn't be adequate. Um, so their representation from the biomedical campus within their travel plan, um, their long-term travel plan, isn't that um, the, the park and ride capacity is sufficient. <coughs> I just, what I, what I was saying was why all those three green arrows, mm. um, one of them you could cope with, with the eight and one in the south, could be potentially cope with by the rail connections. I think and that assumes that everyone will be going to the biomedical campus, doesn't it? Well, you, you, haven't, you don't know yet where they're going to get, but looking just at the Barnett campus, and you're saying that they want, um, they've identified that they want more car parking spaces, essentially. Um, one thing I did wonder was whether you could make a, a dedicated car park for um, the biomedical campus in that stretch of land between the um, Anbrook's access road and the M11. Um, east Sorry, of which stretch of land are you referring to? Um, um, between yeah. Anbrook's access and... Where, where's the Anbrook's access road on that map? I remember there was a... Um, there were plans <coughs> to put a waste recycling road <coughs> close to the M11 um, between Anbrook's access road and the M11. There's quite a lot of land... No, no, I see, are you talking around here? Or? Um, uh, further west than that. So okay. you're talking about before you get to the Anbrooks Access Road, which is before Fletcher House, I believe. Yes. So yes. the area yeah. between the Anbrooks and Greenbelt. Yeah, it's just about there. Still in the Greenbelt here. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, is, it is Greenbelt, you're right. It's all Greenbelt. It's, it's all Greenbelt. Greenbelt. <laughs> well, yes. Um, well, a lot of it did, uh, is, is not Greenbelt, but it was Greenbelt in the past, which has been built on. Uh, for the southern fringe developments. Yeah. So, it's, you know, I mean, what remains is to be felt about is true. And I would like you to look at that bit of land as a, as a possible um, dedicated car park for the biomedical campus, seeing as they have said they want, that's what they want. Um, you could quite easily transport people from there to the biomedical campus. I don't think uh, Jesus College are likely to be interested in that prospect uh, because they see it as a potential site for 85,000 square metres of research and development and 1,250 houses. So I don't think they're likely to be willing to dispose of it to the county council. I think also at, at the moment the, um, uh, the Adam Brooks Access Road is, is pretty heavily congested and then for 2031 the, the congestion going into um, parts um, chapter 11. Uh, into Cambridge is extremely difficult. You have to get them to go to the Trumpeton uh, Park and Line and get on the. Um, on the last one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the sort of thing. Could, could I just ask what, do you have absolute numbers to go with these percentages? Do we have absolute numbers? Uh, yes, not, yeah. not tonight, not this evening. Because uh, I think it's pretty helpful when trying to give feedback and make decisions if you use lots of numbers. For uh, and the capacity of the existing societies, and for example, what capacity could be taken by a uh, uh, site further along the A10, like for example, that Foxton. So that, if, if that might not affect the 4422, it would obviously affect, well, that's not true actually, it wouldn't affect the 44, it could well affect the 30 and the 22, because up from that in the moment coming south, uh, some people may well. Um, not come up the end of the tour, but may in fact go to Foxton. They wouldn't choose to come up the end of the tour, uh, the they may just simply go to a Foxton uh, as well as Foxton to the We can share that on this. And does this take into account the fact that they will be a Cambridge South Station? Um, it take a lot of people, or should take a lot of people? No, the model doesn't take that into account. So that's quite a big church. Sure. I think mean, this, this is a general point because it applies on the A1307 project as well, where, as we understand it, the Cambridge Subregional Model projections uh, in terms of the 
mega busway from the A505 to the Cambridge Biomedical Campus uh, does not uh, take account of Addenbrook South Station. Uh, that, it is doubtful whether it does at the moment, that's our, our understanding. And for a number of these issues, whether it's the A1307 or the Western, uh, the Park and Ride, Western Orbital, it is really important that account is taken of Cambridge South Station. Yes, because when they say in there, you know, when the biomedical campus presumably say in there, when there's their own um, traffic uh, um, uh, report, that mm -hmm. they want greater park and ride. I mean, if, if, if out of scope is anything to do with rail and... They do say in their study, they want to at least actually to... Yeah, but, 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 if you, but if you've not done a, a, a study of various car parks at all these points that would feed into the South Station, then it's just a huge missing link to, in, in the whole plan. It would be really useful actually to, 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 uh, to find out where you get the percentages from. These are, these are 2031, so yeah. you know, looking at the 44% that you say are coming south and, and in relation to what the existing number of the demand is. But of course, you've got the Western Orbital which has been suspended, but are we assuming with this model that people who might otherwise have taken the Western Orbital to link the 428 would be getting on the bus, but because that's been pushed to one side, they're now getting in their car. So is this assumption about, and is it also making an assumption about in <laughs> development in you know, uh, wintering, wintering them uh, near St. Neots, uh, West Camborne, are all those numbers being taken into account in terms of the, of, of the demand? And is that 44%? I mean, so I suppose what I'm saying is where are these figures coming from and what assumptions are you making about the increase in growth, particularly in housing growth in, in the area? the Cambridge Sub-Regional Model 2. Um, and they do factor in the local plan growth. Um, they fa factor in other approved growth sites. Camborne um, West um, is warm, which was above local plan allocation, but it, it factors in that. Of the growth, um, and that's where the stats come from. But so that will that 44% drop if the Western Orbital route, and, and there's, a, there's a, 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 an effectively a, a dedicated <coughs> busway running alongside the M11, will that 44% drop to 35%? Or it, will, it will drop actually, yes. Um, so we have um, factored that in. If the Western Orbital online sort of bus service was provided, there will be a slight reduction. Yeah, it's only slight, and again, I can share those, those numbers with you. Oh, really? um, How slight is slight? Yeah. I think it's percentage, a uh, short percentage, maybe. Is it, uh, well, yeah. in terms of the Western Orbital, the sort of specific model one hasn't been in the for the Western Orbital sort of such. So these figures are from the city access so the group. Okay. So in terms of to get figures like you were talking about, so to factor in the percentages for if you say and listen to what to open, that would be sort of the next phase next phase of work when we get a dedicated Western to work on the model. That makes sense. No it doesn't. <laughs> no it doesn't get factored in, it doesn't make sense. So what I'm gonna say those figures are basically they don't consider a small They don't take account. No. So they don't consider they don't consider uh, an, an offline or Western Orbital service. Could I just ask why they haven't considered making the existing Trumpington Park and Ride much bigger? Well, I will get to that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it would be quite a, a run through the, the presentation, um, so if I may. Um, so this is just an indication. I, I, I indicated where. Um, the site was and the field boundary that the sort of land option will be. This is a rough approximation of, of how large a site might be, but this would include things like um, associated landscaping and drainage facilities and things like that. So it's just to give a rough idea. Can I just ask, please, what, mm -hmm. about, what about protecting the existing public rights of way that are on there? This is public rights of way. Across that land? Mm -hmm. um, that I, I don't think they would be altered. Well, you're putting a car park across them. Well, Have you taken that into consideration? There is permissive access across there at the moment. Yeah, it's no, important permissive access as well. I don't think that would be altered. Um, I mean, we haven't specifically 
um, mapped the uh, mapped where the um, rice of way are. Um, if we were to interact with those again, I mean this is just a, a sketch and indication of how uh, the size of the site. If it was to interact with the committed rice of way, then um, then we would need to factor that in. But you haven't. Uh, not the natural one there, no. But, but you will be factoring them in yes. and protecting them. Yes, we would have to do that. I mean. It, it, by being permitted, that means that they're permitted by the landowner um, and therefore they can be restricted. Um, but yes, we would have to factor that in the design of any, any site development. How big is that actually? It looks huge. Um, it, it's not much bigger than the existing site. Effectively, what we thought was that the, the existing site was quite constrained <coughs> in its landscaping and its drainage, um, and therefore, effectively, it would just be a, a little larger than the existing site. Okay, so moving on to why, um, or, or the evaluation that we've undertaken about the existing site um, as to a new site. Um, and when we talk about um, the existing site, the options that we discussed at um, previous VAs and forums of decking um, and the, um, the additional consideration of the VAs and forum was that we also look at underground. Um, uh, and on a new site, it will be at ground level. And so therefore, um, the, the cost estimates that have been provided are that um, for a new site at um, approximately eight, 8 million, and you can see there that, that the decking solution will be approximately 50 million to deliver and underground approximately 97 million. Um, um, and talk about the access, um, the access of the existing site will be <coughs> utilising the existing park and ride access and the new site um, would um, the access to the site will be provided um, directly off the A10. Does, um, that, does that 8 million account for the dedicated bus infrastructure required to connect to new site? No, it doesn't. Um, it's for a new site. Um, but similarly, nor does the 50 or 97 million um, account for any of the new access that will be required to accommodate um, uh, growth at that site. Does it include um, the access of the A10, the A10? Be a bridge, tunnel, or traffic lights, or roundabout. For the for an example, yeah, no, it doesn't. It's for really doing this by bits, aren't you? Well, we, we are literally saying to expand the existing site. This is what it will take, um, fifty or ninety-seven, and for a new site, this is what it will take for ancillary um, or accessing arrangements. So, for it to be a new um, access of the um, M11, but that would apply actually to both schemes. And we haven't factored that into either, um, and so it's an estimate for what it would be to develop either the existing site or the it, it just It just seems like a, a slightly unfair comparison of numbers because, for one, you're saying, look, it's the same site, really, to accommodate more cars, we should make a wider entrance. So, and, and maybe we could improve it in lots of other ways, which you would still need to do with the new site. Whereas with the new site, you are going to have to connect it to the other side of the motorway. That's, I would assume, vastly more expensive than a bigger opening into the trunk. If you're going to sort of summary of on the website, there's sort of various options that yeah. you can pick and choose for different um, access to different sites. So different option, options for accessing from say the M11 south from M11 north and M10. So it's sort of it's hard to sort of just um, show in this way but it's almost a pick and choose you can kind yeah. of build the matrix of different it's options a, for it's a presentation all the cost issue, there it's, it? yeah it's just hard it's to just a little present. bit unfair because on the one hand you're saying Finger in the air, 50 to 100 million, and the other one you're saying, oh, it's well, well under 10. Which is the just presentationally, itself. it seems a little bit unfair. Yeah. Well, well it's, it's, it's just looking at the site itself. In terms of access options, you need to bring forward access options if you were just looking at the existing site or if you were looking at the new site. All those are listed in the report, it's just yeah. it's quite a lot of them to present them. It's difficult. And, and to be honest, you, you need, like I say, you need access options for whatever you chose to do. So this is this is the direct comparison is the cost of the site, and then actually access options, which will be further developed in the next stage. They're all there, but it's it's fourteen. I think it is a contentious issue as to whether the slip roads, let's call them slip roads, for the sake of argument. Um, are likely to be more costly for the existing site or for the new site. Because when you look at the detail, it's, it's not immediately clear that the access arrangements for the new site would be more expensive than those for the existing site. I um, mean, this is one of the frustrations that the slip roads have been uh, uh, looked at separately. 
uh, from the park and ride options, and really they need to be looked at together because the junction 11 uh, roundabout is so congested, you're getting traffic from 11, M11 coming north across <coughs> into the existing park and ride is also likely to be uh, significantly expensive. So really it would be helpful if they were looked at together. So I, I think the point that's being made there is effectively that the connotations um, are that there, that there could be 40 different options to look at there. I understand. And I think that we, what we've tried to do is separate out those issues so that they can then be looked at in parallel rather than the assumption that a new site would need a slip road and then um, an existing site would. Sure. Uh, and and that's, that's the reason why we've done that. Um, I apologise if that's not clear. Can I just say perhaps what would be helpful when you, when you um, present a summary like this is to add another line that says, you know, um, ancillary works will cost between this range, depending on which option of all the, goodness knows how many you've listed here in your report. Yeah, and, and, and it varies from, you know, a few hundred Ks to like 24 million. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I, I think by not putting in some figures to give a cost of operation comparable, you're actually seeking to almost deceive people into thinking the only figure you can look at is the 8 million and the 50 to 97. And that's not on, really not. Why, do, If you can put in one line cost in 50 to 97 million or 8 million, why can't you for operation put in some figures like that? Even a rate. As I said, Maybe, uh, we could have put in a range that it wasn't something deliberately we didn't do, it's just because the range... Well, was it's something that you chose not options. to do, and you could have done it, and it would have made for a much better, fairer debate if you'd put those figures in. And by not doing so, you're really making a slight mockery of the whole summary you've put up there. Okay, well, I, I disagree with that. I, I think the reason, Fine. Um, the reason that we did it is because we think that to support both sites for the development, there will be a cost associated with that, that access and to separate out the cost of effectively what will be the, the footprint of a new site versus the footprint of going underground or going above ground. Um, and that's the reason that we would put that as a comparison. Could you just spend in one bit, missing bit of information that several people have implied they'd like the answer to? And that's the land ownership question in the area between the current P, uh, PNR and the M11. Um, because the fact that you say it's definitely on the ground implies it is absolutely impossible to take any further land in that quadrant. It does, it does imply that. Um, the, Why? Because their, their house is currently being built around there. It's going to say from the point of view. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that there is plans, barracks are building, we're about to sort of phase eight, phase nine, whatever, yeah. through where currently the uh, Southampton Parish is. Yeah. That will continue all the way around uh, up to the Hawkeson Road, it'll go back into the Cambridge city boundary as well. There is a small area which I think Grover also own between there and the motorway. And they yeah. had plans for a, a sporting village and then I've got put an old doll waiting to find out what's going on here. So it's not as if that the original map we had was just vacant land that hasn't been used. Yeah. And the other reason why I think South Trumpeton does need to be represented on here is that um, if it comes to decking, that came up in our last parish meeting. Mm -hmm. And this suggestion <laughs> would actually have a large impact on residential properties there um, if there are people on another deck. <laughs> but equally, some of the proposed sites for that decking was around the primary school, and there might then be an issue in terms of people on an upper, upper deck overlooking a primary school. Is there a, an issue there in terms of children's um, you know, sort of day to day lives and so on? So it's, it's one of the issues that I think needs to be considered. I, I think residential community in relation to decking will be something that needs to be considered. Yes, we consider effectively the perimeter of the site being the point upon which we can't go beyond because Barrett's are currently building those houses and, and obviously there will be no way. So there was no consideration at the time of the original work and ride of any need for expansion? Um, in 2001, I think it was, the, the original park and ride was given permission on, or opened, on, I'm not quite sure. Um, but no, I don't think that. I, I think actually that it was phased in terms of its car parking. So the full number, which of 1,340 spaces, wasn't um, fully built out then, and that they have built up more. There has since been an application to extend the capacity of the site, and actually the subject of September's um, um, board paper that we took forward was to further effectively fill the envelope of the site 
um, with car parking spaces. So there is exp further expansion planned? Yes, that's right. 299 um, spaces as well. Yeah. Yeah. So half the 600 that you mentioned being needed in total, if it was simply uh, looking... 2,000. Yes, but there was mention of 600 being, if you simply took the need for parking lot as opposed to extra being drawn in by the way from the board. <coughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, I'm afraid. Okay. Can, can you, yes. um, is it possible to investigate extending into the sporting village area? Because that could solve the problem. Um, well, we have spoken to the landowners. The landowners have aspirations for development in that area. I think that it's pretty well known that they, they would like to put sporting boat into there, or that they call it sporting boat, housing boat. Um, it has been withdrawn that application, I understand. Um, but uh, I think that there perhaps are still, um, there's, there's still a will to have some development there. It would be very unlikely, having spoken to them, that they would consider having a parking lot there. If we had to, therefore, if we had to deliver that, uh, we would have to seek compulsory purchase powers and having a suitable alternative would undermine the compulsory purchase hour, uh, order uh, process. Well, actually, there are, there are no arguing for a, uh, for this development to which we are bitterly opposed uh, through the local plan modific uh, modification process. Uh, that's what they're going for, is to persuade the inspector uh, that that parcel of land should be um, allocated within the revised local plan as land for development. So I think it is very unlikely uh, that they are likely to be willing to dispose of that site. Who actually does own the land? Who? Grover. 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 Oh, it's all Grover, is it? Yes. yes. The whole lot? The, the whole part of, um, effectively, between the barracks development, housing development, and the M11. Yes. And on the other side? On the other side, actually, Grosvenor do own that, but the County Council, at the time of um, uh, undertaking the land agreement for the existing Trumpeton Meadows um, housing development, secured a land option for, for that parcel of land. So Pemberton, Pemberton family don't own any of that? No. no. That, that, I think they work that, um, on behalf of Grosvenor, but I'm not 100% sure, um, but, but I know that Grosvenor own it. I think Is this going to be the main car park, I think you reckon 2,000 cars in this park and ride that you want? Yes. Well, have you ever considered... When you say main, that there will be two sides. But Junction 11 is such a busy junction now, you've got a single road coming off on a double lane carriageway. By 2031, mm -hmm. they'll all be stagnant back to Stansted. Um. Yes. Uh, I think at the moment, actually, um, going back to Cambridge um, and coming off at um, coming yeah. off at Junction 11 from Stansted, um, yeah. actually, the, the, it, it, the queuing isn't as bad on the hard shoulder as it is um, coming from the other way. Um, and our proposals would have to be accepted by Highways England. It wouldn't further exacerbate the, those um, on um, motor queuing. Can I just clarify that this is in addition to the 2,000 spaces that have also been planned as part of the A1307 earlier? Yes. The plan is to do both. Yes, so yes. Not either or. No. Okay. Uh, perhaps a final word. One, one thing that, speaking from a Haskin point of view, one thing that really makes this unacceptable is the fact that it's eating away at that boundary between the southern boundary of Cambridge City and, and the, the northern boundary of uh, Hawkston and Houston. There's a very strong feeling in Houston, I think also in Hawkston, that we must maintain that piece of land, that open space, that uh, the area of Greenbelt. We do not wish to become absorbed into Cambridge City, full stop. And I can assure you that in terms of public opinion in Austin, that is a very strong feeling.
Buxton. Yeah, uh, and actually I've been to, been to the parish council meeting where they've expressed that to me. I would point out that um, in terms of Greenbelt, that both sites are within Greenbelt, although the existing site only partially. Um, so in terms of policy and development, the Greenbelt would still be applicable in the existing site, although less so in terms of consideration because it, it's already developed form. Um, but yes, the Greenbelt would need to be considered as part of the, um, any uh, planning application that would be considered. Just to balance those statements, the um, popular opinion within Trumpington is very strongly opposed <coughs> to any narrow, further narrowing of the gap between uh, what is the new city edge, which runs along the bottom of the trunk of the Meadows estate, and the M11. And uh, the, as I say, there is very strong opposition to that. Yeah, and again, I've met with the um, new trunk of the South Parish uh, Council and the Resident Association, and I understand that, but I have that before. Mm -hmm. Effectively, it is, it is a balance of, of um, uh, local opinion on one side of the real. Sure. Okay. okay, so here is just a programme that is in the report, um, should um, the Assembly and then subsequently the Board um, uh, take on the recommendation for, the, for a new site, um, that just details a, an estimation of um, the, the programme that will be required um, to do that. Um, this is in the report um, that it's taken directly from. Um, so I'll move on to the, the next slide. It says thank you for your questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a, a question? When, when the um, charge for the park and ride came in, there was a big drop off in the usage of the park and ride. What, is, you, what are you assuming in terms of the charge for the park and ride? Because there's talk about it becoming zero in which case the usage would go up considerably. My understanding is that, um, that the county council is looking to um, get rid of that charge um, by April um, next year. Right. Um, and, uh, however, I, I would say that the, um, the understanding of the study is that, that yes, park and ride across Cambridgeshire has gone down as a, as a result of the, um, uh, the pound charge being introduced. However, specifically at Trumpington, there's been a much less impact. Um, but that's not to say that if the pound charge is removed, um, that it won't make it more um, uh, attractive to people to park and ride um, in, in that location. Or so your, your, figure, your, your figures are based on what? A pound charge or a zero charge or what? So the, the basis yeah, of the demand... totally change. The base on demand and the, um, uh, the movements as they are at the moment. Um, okay. yeah, so it's, there's um, an allowance that's been made for the charge being removed, um, a 5% uplift in, in usage has been added. So let's do it the stream, no charge. Yes, yeah, so uh, We've got 45 minutes and we need to discuss what the members think about this report now. This way you to Okay, so this was um, um, this was a recognition that we have not had answers <coughs> to the questions that were posed of um, the Western Orbital team in the last um, MLF meeting on the 11th of September. I've not had any written reply or we haven't had answers to either the questions posed by Trumpington um, or posed by Wilson. Mm -hmm.